Amen. We are on part 13 of walking through the book of Ephesians. And so what we're going to do is we are going to look at the armor of God this week, and next week we're going to break it down into two different parts. Uh, And so that's kind of what we're at. And so then we will kind of go from there. Uh, But let's kind of do a recap. And I think sometimes people always ask me, well, why do you do this? Why do you always recap? We were here last week. Right, but do you remember everything? They're like, well, no. Like, well, good, because I don't either. Like, (laughs) right, like we're just humans. We forget things all the time. So we always kind of walk through stuff and I always kind of recap things. Um, And so if you remember, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians is all talking about our identity, right, who we are in Christ. And it's not about what we grew up in. It's not about what we learned or what we think or this or our heritage or so many other things. Paul was trying to break down as he's in prison, like this is who God is calling us to be as Christians in that day and age and that time. And so he's like, this is what it is. It's all about being a brand new Christian. And then chapters 4 and 5 and the first part of 6 are about living those things out. Like this is how this plays out practically in our lives, in real life situation in that time. right? We spent a whole week talking about the word submit and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because there was real issues going in in that time. Like, so he's just trying to explain these things. And then at the end of chapter 6, it gets kind of interesting. Um, he, he starts talking about this idea that he uses soldier lingo. We don't use soldier lingo unless they're going to war, right? Like, unless there's some sort of, like, battle taking place. You're not dressing up as SEAL Team 6 unless there's a reason for it, you know? And so, like, that's kind of what Paul is describing and talking about and going through the, the last chapter of Ephesians 6. So that's kind of where, you know, we are at. Let me kind of give you an idea of how I approach things um, for you. I approach things as a pastor as that I'm a tour guide. I'm a tour guide to how try to help you understand Scripture just really practically, simply, so you can apply it into your life, whether it's faith and Jesus and Scripture and biblical things, so that you can do that. Now, At the same time, I'm not your babysitter, right? So a lot of times we see each other, and I just say hi. I don't bring church up, right? If I see you at the gym or a football game or a kid's event or school or anything else, I don't bring stuff up. I think sometimes once in a while people are like, well, why don't you bring stuff up? I'm like, because I'm just a human. You're a human. You're a grown adult. I'm a grown adult. Like, if you want to talk about it, I'm cool with that. But I'm not your babysitter where I'm like, did you do the take home from this week? Like, I don't approach things that way. Like, I'm not trying to belittle anybody at all, right? Like, and so that's just kind of where I come from, right? I'm not God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not your conscience. I'm not walking around going naughty, 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 or good job. Like, I don't do that sort of thing. I got 35 to 40 minutes. I talk way too fast, right? And that's it. That's all I got, right? And so you do that with with kind of what it is, but that's really how I view things. Now, sometimes it can be a hard balance, right? Because I go, man, if we're talking about a situation and I'm sitting there going, yeah, but I do remember talking about this like three weeks ago. So if you would have applied things, maybe you wouldn't be in said situation. So sometimes those can get kind of tricky, right? But at the end of the day, I'm never like, that's just how I approach life too. Like I can't control your life. And sometimes it can get really hard, right? It can, but That's kind of how I approach things and how I go through things. So last week, we talked about spiritual warfare. And we talked about how we shouldn't see the devil in everything, but he's still alive, he's still active, but he's not all powerful either, but he doesn't exist either. Like, he does exist, and I think sometimes we kind of get too crazy with things. There's some that group of people that he's around every corner. Every time you get a cold, you sneeze and you think it's the devil. Right? And then there's other play people, and you're like, the devil doesn't exist at all, and none of it matters at all. It's like, well, there's got to be some sort of even medium. And we talked about how there is a real battle for our souls. But the battle isn't against individual people. We're not fighting each other. You're not fighting a certain political party or this or that. And No, we're fighting evil. And yes, people do evil things, but people, those individuals, are not our enemy. They're not our enemy. So we should always, uh, we respect the enemy, but we're not afraid of them and all this other stuff, right? And so that's kind of what we talked about last week. 
This week we're going to dive into the armor of God. So let's read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. I'm stopping at 15. We'll do the rest of the chapter next week. But here is what it says. A final word. Like, hold up real quick before you guys dip. This is what Paul's got to say. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, and the body of armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. The whole reason for the armor, guys, is that we can stay standing strong. If we're here to stay standing, that means God's already taken the territory. We're trying to take over someplace. Our job is just to stand. God's already won the ultimate fight. That's why we can fight with this idea that we've already won. Like if you know the end of the story, Jesus is coming back. Right? There's all this ideas around eschatology. Eschatology is the, the term that people use for the study of the end times, like all this stuff. And the only thing we can concretely say 100% in the Bible is Jesus is going to come back. When, how that looks is up for a lot of debate. A lot of discussion. There's a lot of books that are written about it and a lot of um, very passionate people around this topic and discussion. But Jesus is going to come back, so we know we're going to win, so let's just let, let's stand on that. Armor. So this, and you go, why? Well, here's the deal. Paul would have probably, very possibly, been tied to a Roman soldier while in jail. They probably would have taken turns and things like that. A couple of them would have done it. But he would have probably been chained to a Roman soldier while in jail. What's also interesting, if you've ever read the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, it actually talks about God's legit armor at the same time, and he uses this stuff as well, which is also very interesting. So could this have just been a hypothetical, like, mysterious, like, hey, they just happened to correlate to each other? Possibly. Or was God, or was Paul, because being, you know, led by the Holy Spirit, actually describing like God's legit armor. And you're like, oh, that's way cooler. Like, take that, Iron Man. You ain't got nothing on God, dude. Like, right? Like, that's way cooler than you're like, oh, so God's actually, like, Paul's actually describing God's actual armor. It's like, oh, okay. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to just address those three things today, and then we'll address the next two next week. So, the first one is this is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Here's what I find interesting. When you get dressed, does anybody get dressed belt first? <laughs> but it's the first thing he mentions. Right? Like, don't get mad at me. I didn't do this list in this order. Right? Like, but the first thing he mentions is the belt of truth. Now, when we hear belt of truth, the actual best terminology for it is girdle. And us guys were like, ugh. No, no, we're not good with that. But actually, what because here's what it was meant for. It was the purpose of it was to support stability and to stabilize you when picking something up heavy. The best thing we could possibly look at in our culture is a weightlifting belt because you put it on to support yourself when you're lifting heavy things to keep you in the right posture. And everything else. Why? Well, it's a weightlifting belt. It's like, ah, gotcha. That is the best way to describe what he's describing as the belt of truth. Now, what is he meaning here? What does he mean by the belt of truth? He's talking about scripture. Paul's talking about scripture. Because it's the truth that stabilizes our lives and supports us when the world is coming down on us. When all hell is breaking loose, what do we have that supports us? It should be truth. That's why it's so vital for you to actually know what the Bible says yourself and not just take my word for it. I've often thought about actually doing an entire sermon saying it was from a Bible and not. <laughs> just to see if anybody would actually notice. Like, I'll make up like, like really? <laughs> I haven't done it yet. Don't worry. Haven't done it yet. But wouldn't that be interesting to, to do? 
just to see, right, just to see if anybody actually noticed. Oh, just thoughts that go through my head. I'm, every thought that goes through my head isn't a good one or a smart one, okay? Like, <laughs> things just go through my head once in a while, right? Like, <laughs> like, this is the truth. And here's the deal. The truth is what stabilizes us. It's just a biblical principle. It's true for kids, teenagers, adults. It's just the truth. Truth is our protection against deception, right? Truth, God's truth is our protection against deception. So what we learn here is God's number one protection, number one ep- ep- weapon against the enemy is truth. And the enemy's number one weapon is deception. The number one enemy that the thing, the weapon that the enemy has is deception. That's what he's got. The devil will lie about who you are, he'll lie about your value, your purpose, your future, what you're capable of doing, who you are, everything. The way we combat every lie and every deception is knowing what God says about us. And if you don't know what God says about us based off of Scripture, you will always be lost. And if we don't find ourselves rooted in Scripture, being able to stand strong when everything comes down on us, we will crumble. I will fall because I'm not strong enough to stand against it. As parents, I often wonder how much are we letting the world, TikTok, friends, teachers, tell our kids what they're worth rather than Scripture? How much do we do this as adults? How much do we let Instagram and HGTV and whatever thing you, right? Like, Tell us this is what you're worth. This is what your life should be like. This is what makes you successful. This is what makes you good. This is what makes, whatever. This is how you know you've made it. Or you ever ask that question to yourself? How do you know you've made it? You think you've made it and then somebody else has made it more. And you're like, oh, well, they make more. That doesn't mean they made it. Right? But like we get these ideas in our heads. It's a really hard balance. It's a really hard balance in our lives. It's a really hard balance, especially as parents, of letting our kids make their own decisions and choices when it comes to faith, good and bad, and how how much, how many times and how far do we let them fall before we help them get back up, before they learn their own hard lessons, everything else. It's hard. It's hard. The issue is, is no matter what, as parents, as adults, we need to lead by example. We have to see ourselves in our homes, in the world, in our futures, in our careers through the lens of Scripture, or all of it will collapse really fast. From political issues to social and moral and spiritual issues, we have to know what God says, otherwise we can't stand on it. And so many people, the only time you are building yourself spiritually is 38 minutes when I'm talking. You're not going to stand very long on that, guys. Like I'm just telling you. I'm not that good. Nobody is. Nobody is. Right? But this is where context comes in. This is where context comes in. Because you can take Scripture, memorize a proverb, memorize a psalm, memorize this verse and this verse and this verse, totally botch it, right? Totally misapply so many things. And be like, I don't know why I got this verse. Well, yeah, but that's not how it was ever meant to be applied. Like, ah. And honestly, it's one of the things I actually like enjoy doing. It's trying my best, don't always succeed, but trying my best to take scripture and make it easy to understand. Like it's just sometimes I listen to a lot of pastors, and man, we can talk really big lingo churchy things. And I'm like, man, there's times where I've listened to sermons. I'm like, dude, I'm more confused. <laughs> I'm more confused than I was before. Like, you ever been there? You're like, I don't like that. I don't like that. If scriptures are truth, we stand and we have to understand it. Truth. But here's the deal. It's not just truth in scripture. It's truth. If truth is on one side and deception is on the other side, we have to stand in truth in all aspects of our life. So how many times do we try to deceive something else? 
you ever buy something from, and then you don't want your spouse to find out, so you use your card and not the card. Christmas time is a different story, okay? Like, but like you know what I mean? Like, you're like, well, I needed the pair of shoes. I needed the purse or whatever, right? Like, I had to spend $150 in that pre-workout this month. Like, whatever it is, your gig, right? Like, I needed the haircut. I needed this. I needed that. Like, deception. Deception. How many times, as a parent, your kids ask you a question, and they're old enough for the real answer, but you don't want to have the conversation. So you give them some bull answer just to blow them off. You deceive them just a, just a little bit. If we're really going to live a life based off of truth, deception has to stop in all areas of our life. Truth has to be truth, whether we're dealing with coworkers or a boss or, or siblings or spouses. Truth matters. It's not just saying this is what the Bible says. No, it's truth in all areas of life. Are we deceiving people in our lives? Are we being honest with God and others and ourselves? Ourselves. Are you lying to yourself about the condition of your life? Right? <laughs> Come on. We, we've all done this. Right? The fish I caught when I was 12 years old was this big. I was this good of an athlete as a high school. You know what I mean? Like, deception doesn't work. It doesn't work. I heard it said this way, the belt of truth is having no disguises before God and man. I was like, oh, okay. Okay. It's different. I got thinking. One of the most uh, interesting stories in the Bible is King David. King David went like this. King David has some issues. But in Psalms 139, he says this. He says, search me, O God. It's like, ah. It's like, God, just search me. Be open to anything and everything. Search me. It's not that he wasn't without fault. He was a human being like everybody else that's ever existed on the face of the planet. He's like, search me. Search me. See, the enemy wants you to hide and lie to yourself, to your family, to God, the people around you. That's what he wants. Deception is on one side of this battle and truth is on the other side. We have the ability to choose which one. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. This thing would have covered you from neck to waist. Front and back, it would have been heavy metal, and they would have been meant to protect the most vital organs of your body. And so I believe that Scripture and Paul is trying to teach us what's the most vital thing? Righteousness. Righteousness. And there's two different views about what Paul's talking about. It's probably, let's be honest, both of them. One, it's God's imparted righteousness on us. Because the fact is, is that we're counted righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross and our personal relationship with him. No prayer, no church attendance, not taking communion, being baptized, or any other like religious activity that you could possibly think of can ever earn you righteousness. Only Jesus' death on the cross can and did. Or, or what he's possibly talking about is practical righteousness. What he was just talking about the last couple of chapters about things, how we should act and how we should live. All the things that Paul was like, do this and don't do this. Do this and don't do this. This is how you treat these. All this stuff. This is what Paul is saying. Protect this. If the enemy can get a crack in the armor of our righteousness, he can get us to believe that we're not his children and he can get us to run from God. Here's what I mean. Uh, the first sin, Adam and Eve. They ate the fruit, they shouldn't have ate, and immediately afterwards they felt shame and they tried to hide. They went, oh, busted, let's hide. Because I somehow, some way, God made us, but if we hide in this bush, he might not see us. <laughs> Good one, Adam. Way to lead by example. Like, let it go, buddy. 
right? Like they hid. They hid. Why he got them to try to run from him. Now, God in his ever loving, caring, compassionate, it's like, guys, I can see you. <laughs> you know, like, peekaboo. Like, you know, it's the four year old playing hide and seek, right? Like, that's what I really feel like. He was like, seriously? You're 26. Like, I think, yeah, I can, you know, I can find you. Like, that's, that's what we try and do. We mess up and we go, oh, and we try to run from God. What happens is we give the enemy just enough wiggle room to bring accusations, guilt, shame, and more. The devil knows we will run from God rather than to God. It is just our natural human instinct to run away. What do we do? What do we do? Well, it's kind of simple and difficult all at the same time. Do what you always know you should do. You ever get that feeling? I should make a phone call. You don't. I should forgive so and so from 26 years ago, but we don't want to. I should send the text. I should be kind to the kid at school. I should invite some. Like this, this little like, oh, just do that. Do do the thing that in your gut in the moment you go, I should do this. Do that. Now, I understand it is about 1.6 million times easier for me to say that than it is to do it. We've all been there. But if you want to continue, you want the armor to be strong and not to be cracks in it and full of holes, do what you know you should do. So what is it that you know you should do that you haven't done? Right? Like, if we're going to sit here in the middle of this thing, we're about halfway through. Ask ourselves that question. What is it I know that I should be doing, that I should have done already, that I didn't do? Just, oh, oh, it's hard. I did that this week. I was kind of grumpy about something. And I was in prayer, stupid prayer. I was venting slash praying. Anybody with me? Are you that spiritual too? You call prayer venting? Right, like, not a venti, like a Starbucks venti. Venting, as in like, stay away from ventis. My goodness, they're like 3,000 calories in a cup. Um, <laughs> like venting, right? Like I was complaining to Jesus. That's how I call my prayer life. Anyways, and he was like, well, have you done A, B, C, D, or E lately? I'm like, no. Well, loser, you got nothing to complain about. Yeah, it's gone. Right? Like, we've all been there where we are complaining about a, any situation ever. Like, well, have, did you do anything to fix it? Change it? To change that person? So, I don't know why my boss hates me so much, blah, blah, blah. Well, have you showed up on time lately? Well, no. Guess what? Just being five minutes early every day and doing your job is a pretty good start. Like, just do that. You want to get a promotion? Go a little bit extra or a lot extra. It'd be great. But what is it that you know you should do that you just simply haven't done? See, righteousness is not based on our works. We do things not to earn anything, but to follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and paid the price that we couldn't pay. Scripture tells us the penalty for sin is death. So we all deserve to die and spend eternity in hell. That's what sin does for us. That's why Jesus came to die on the cross. And he paid a price and rose from the dead. I mean, that's, that's Good Friday and Easter. But it's for our sins. It's so that we never have to pay the price because we couldn't pay it anyways. That, that's how we get righteous. And we're like, God, I love you. So you do things because of what he did, not to earn it. Because you can never earn it in the first place. So we have truth fighting deception. We have God's righteousness fighting against accusations our own stuff. And the third thing is this, is the shoes of peace. Now shoes. We think shoes, you think of like, maybe, you know, some army boots or red wing steel toed shoes. Those aren't them. You're talking sandals. They would walk out and battle in sandals. Now there would be some pretty legit sandals, right? They would have been probably wrapped up halfway up your calf and all the more. But these guys, you know what these guys would do? these guys. <laughs> um, they would actually take little nails 
and like hook them to the bottom of their shoes. It was the first use of cleats. And it would keep them from sliding backwards. Because if you've ever seen, they all have like the big old shields, right? They're in like a box. And like they would get pushed on so they wouldn't slide back. They would have cleats, essentially, little nails on their sandals to keep them from sliding backward. It would keep them holding on to the ground. So what do we hold on to? It's what we just talked about. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. That's our firm for footing in our lives. Is that Jesus came to bring peace and unity between mankind and God. So we just talked about that's why he came to seek and save that which was lost. If we weren't lost, we wouldn't need Jesus. If we didn't have sin, we wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need a savior. But I sinned a lot, so I need a savior. Like that, that's the whole thing. That's why we stand strong. That's why we're affirming in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The enemy wants people to doubt the gospel. They doubt his love and his compassion and his grace and his wisdom and his forgiveness. He says, no, that's not really real. You've done too much. Right? How many shows and movies and people do we hear and talk about, like, oh, I've done too much. I couldn't possibly go to church. Like, nope, nope, nope. Can we strike me down before I even get in there? It's like, I promise you, you won't. Guaranteed, right? Like, it's not going to happen. I can't count how many times I talk to people like, well, I better get my life in order first. Like, I got to do, if I do, once I do A, B, and C, then I can start coming to church. I'm like, dude, you're never going to do A, B, and C. Like, it's never going to happen. We all need help. And so Paul's telling us to stand firm with the gospel of what Jesus has already done, of what he did and what it meant. That's what Paul's telling us. This is how we stand firm. Because there's a real battle and there's real crap that's going to take place. And there's real stuff and we better have tools and resources to fight against the spiritual battle that is taking place that we cannot see. The gospel is everything. So we sink our cleats into it more and more and more. One of the things I think that helps people is we don't talk about enough is watching somebody else's life get changed by Jesus. You want to be encouraged? You want to go, man, Jesus is real? Invest in somebody so much that you start talking to them about Jesus and watch Jesus change their life. That'll encourage you more than anything else. When you see somebody legit perform like salvation is a miracle like 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 let's just get that out of the what out of the way salvation is an absolute miracle right so we've talked about miracles before and people are like oh real this like well salvation is so can't anything else be he can change someone's entire eternity he can like you know heal a headache or anything because nothing is too difficult when you're talking about eternity and so jesus wants to change people's lives. But sometimes we think that we have to have all of our ducks in a row, and we have to be a certain level of Christianity before we can tell somebody that, about Jesus, because they're going to look at our lives and go, well, yeah, but I know I saw you. Right? I saw you. And you, you PR'd at the gym, and you stood up, and you yelled out something, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, whatever it is. Like, you, uh-uh, I saw you. Uh-uh. I saw you yell at the ref at your kids' game or whatever the case is. You know what I mean? Like, I, whatever mess up, they're like, I know the real you. Like, yeah, that's the real me. I'm, 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 I'm sinful too. But Jesus just changed my life and he's continuing changing my life and he wants to change yours as well. But we have to invest in people close enough. When I'm telling you, you want to be encouraged if you're struggling with whether or not the gospel is real or not, invest in somebody so much and watch God change their life. It'll change everything about it. It'll change everything about your life. The gospel does call us ambassadors. Or we have a U.S. ambassador across the country that are representing the United States and different countries all over the world. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors of his love, of his joy, of his peace, and his patience, his kindness, and his goodness, his faithfulness, and his gentleness, and self-control. Right? We are ambassadors of what God brings to the table. Satan brings accusations, deception, and doubt. Right? This is spiritual warfare. It's not just what we think is crazy things, and sometimes that is too. But we think that's just it. It's like, no, there's so many other little things. 
at the end of the day, big picture, the enemy's goal is to undo what God is doing. Like That's his ultimate goal. The enemy's goal is to undo everything and anything that God is doing in all aspects of life. And Paul is trying to give us the weapons to come against and stop what the enemy is trying to do. That is why this is, is where it is. Because we talked about last week how bad this was about to get for them. Nero was starting to burn Christians at the stake at night for his awesome parties. That was how bad this was about to get. So he's like, if you don't have things to stand on, you won't be able to stand. And yes, the devil wins once in a while. Like, what do you mean? He wins. I've watched it happen. I've had to admit, devil, you won the battle. All right, then let's do win the next one. I've watched it happen. I've watched churches split, friendships destroyed. I mean, I've, I've, watched, I've watched disgusting, vile things take place. And you're like, the devil won. Or slash is winning, and you're like, yeah, yeah, and it sucks when it happens. Just because he won the battle doesn't mean he's going to win the war. So just because he won something, because you look at a situation and go, yeah, he won that one. Sure, maybe he did. Maybe he won the night, right? Maybe it was Thursday night. Maybe it was Tuesday night. Maybe it was three weeks ago on a Saturday night, and you're like, oh, he won that night. That conversation did not go the way it should have. Okay, that's fine. Just don't let him win the next one. There's always another battle. There's always another fight. Don't let him win the next one. It sucks when he wins. It sucks. The battle is to live out our faith. He's not going to win the next one. It's not easy. The enemy's goal is always to kill, steal, and destroy our lives. Every part of life, our mental health, our physical health, our emotional health, relationships, spiritually speaking, like everything the devil wants to destroy in your life. He just does. He wants to crush you. And he can deceive you, accuse you, make you doubt God's love and his forgiveness for your life, and he will. He will. He will try to win, and sometimes he does. The enemy's going to come, it's just a matter of fact. How we handle it, though, is the question. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. The enemy's going to come. How we handle it is a whole nother issue. My view of it is kind of this way. I think of like waves in the ocean. You ever been to the ocean? It's awesome. Go to the ocean. Um, And sometimes it's smooth. But no matter what happens, no matter how smooth the ocean is, waves are always going to come. Always. No matter what you do, the water is going to hit the shore. doesn't matter if it is 86 degrees and it is perfectly sunny. All right, I remember one time we were there, and uh, this is pre, pre-hurricane, so I don't think the place we stayed at anymore. I think it was Bonita Beach. Anyways, I was kayaking out in the middle of the ocean, just going, doing my thing. Now I'm like, oh, oh, I was like four or five, six hundred yards out. Like Tina was like an ant around the shore. I'm like, I might be a little far. Like, I don't quite know. I definitely can't swim this far out. You know what I mean? I was in one of those situations. Like, my mind started racing. Like, huh. But the water was just, it was like going to Devil's Lake on a calm day, like in August. You're like, there's no wind. This is the worst. We're leaving. Like, all right, the smell's up. You know what I mean? You've been there. You've been in that day. You're like, hmm. This might be dangerous to breathe this in, you know? <laughs> like, right? It was just perfectly, perfectly calm. No matter what, if I stand on the shore, the water is going to hit me. Good, bad, it's going to come. There doesn't need to be a storm for the waves to hit you. And I think this is how I think the devil works. There's no big storm coming. It's just little, it's just going to come. Little deception, little lie, little thing, little, it's just poking the bear. It's constant. Any little wave at that point, next thing you know, you're like, cool, I don't need a flotation device. I don't need anything. I'm good, whatever. Next thing you know, there's a riptide. And next thing you know, you're out in the middle and you're done. Like, why? Because you stop taking precautions. You stop looking at the tide. You stop looking at anything else. And you just realize, like, hey, this is what he does. 
It's just little thing after little thing. It's just life. And pretty soon you're like, oh, I don't really need a breastplate because I don't really feel anything coming at me. I don't really need the shoes. I can take them off. I'm pretty good by myself. I don't really need this belt to hold the weight anymore because I'm good. I feel, I lifted enough that I don't need the belt anymore. And the next thing you know, he doesn't even need, he barely needs any kind of storm whatsoever. Just one little thing knocks us, knocks us over. Why? Because we stopped taking precautions. Now, one of the things that the devil loves to do is he loves to tell us that we can disconnect different parts of our life. You ever hear this? Like, oh, my work life doesn't affect my home life. My home life doesn't affect my work life. How I treat my boss doesn't impact how I treat my spouse. Poor crap. <laughs> right? Like, how I treat my kids doesn't impact how I treat my wife. Oh, that does, those, those two things don't correlate. Like, I can, I can separate everything. It's a lie. It's a little lie. But man, it's a lie. Right? Like, why? Because everywhere we go, we deal with people. God's people. So, how you treat the person at Walmart who helped you in the self-checkout when your stuff wouldn't ring up does actually impact who you are in other places. Why? Because it speaks to who you are as a human being and how we treat people in general. It's a subtle little lie, but man, it's a lie. It's a lie. So it does. It does impact things, right? How you respect your parents does impact how you respect your teachers. How you respect your boss does impact how you respect. By the way, like and it, both things, right? How you respect your boss impacts how your kids respect their teachers, right? How you treat authority impacts how your kids treat authority. This is about personal relationships. So whether it's something that you think is small, or big, it's all connected because it's about people. As we, as we get to leave here in a second, your take home is this, is to remember this. The little things are the big things. The little things are the big things. Like, I just did a devotional, I know, but that one devotional every day for years builds. It, but it, it was only, I just read one, I just read a proverb a day. But guess what? That one proverb a day is God's living act of word. It says it's sharper than a double-edged sword, and that's God's wisdom pouring into your life. So it does build. I, it was just one text message that said, hey, babe, I love you. I know, but you don't know when that one text message can build. Right? It's just one. But it was just three lines. I know. But the little things are the big things. Hey, I don't ever want to talk to you again. Not that long. Impactful. Good and bad. The little things are the big things. It's just, but it's just. I know. And I am one of the least legal, legalistic like pastors. I guarantee you, you will find. I don't bring a ah. Right? Like, we shock people. People come into our house and it's like, Get into our car with us. They're like, if you put on my headphones, I'm at the gym. It's a podcast or hip hop. Like, it's just two of them. It's just weird. I know I'm weird, but like, it's a 50 50 shot. It's a 50 50, literally, it's a 50 50 shot. I'm either in a good mood and I'm like, sweet, like, I'm going to learn something today, or I'm in a bad mood and I'm like, Dr. Dre, like, you know, it's just different. It's just different. Did you know him and Snoop are coming up with a new album? What? Like, Probably can't let my kids listen to it. You know, it's like, where's the edited version? You know, like, but like, I just heard it. It just came to mind. But like, the little things are the big things. How you treat somebody else does impact other things. It's just one comment. It's just one eye roll. Right? It's just one I don't want to. It's just one ignore text or one ignore phone call. It's just one I'm not going to help somebody call, like somebody calls into work and you don't help them. 
and now you're throwing a fit three weeks later when they're not going to help you? It's just it, it was just one call that I ignored because I really wanted to do something else, right? But now the foot, it's just one. It's just one. We could all make this list really, really long. But we do the little things. We are either staying strong, keeping our footing, standing up, making sure there's cracks in the armor. It's just the little stuff. Or we're taking off the bell. We can't carry that much. We're taking our shoes off. We're not able to stand strong when anybody's pushing back on us in any realm of life. And we have no protection. The devil is just darting arrows. We'll learn about that next week. The choice is ours. I can make my own choices, and you can make your own choices. And what you make is different than what I make. And whether or not you make good ones, and I make good ones, or you make bad ones, and I make bad ones, is on you. I want the best for you. And I know there's a spiritual battle for your souls, for your households, for your businesses, and everything that you're a part of. It's real. And I want to be able to give you tools and resources to help you do just that. And God's like, just do the things. Do some of the little stuff and see what happens. Let's pray. Lord, we, you know there's areas that we all need to work on today. There's no one that's excluded for having something to get better at. We all do. It doesn't matter if uh, you've been serving Jesus for 53 years or you are still trying to figure out if you want to serve Jesus and make him Lord and Savior of your life. No matter where somebody stands, there's always something to look at our life and go, God, we need help with that. Lord, help us not to let the devil get cracks in our life. He wants to get in. He, he wants to hurt us. He wants to ruin our, our households, our own personal mental health, and so many more things. But you don't want those things. You want us to stand strong for you. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom and your power and your forgiveness this morning because we cannot do this life successfully without you. I know I can't do it. And since I'm a human, I'm assuming everybody else can't either. Lord, specifically, I pray for that thought of I know it's just something little, but if I know I should do it, I, need, I just need to do it. Give us that strength to do that this morning. This week, this afternoon, to just go, this is what I need to do. This is what I know I should do. To just simply do that one thing. Maybe it is saying a text and saying, hey, I'm sorry. Maybe it's a personal conversation with someone.